Hello, you're listening to People, Pets, and Vets with Dr. Brad Miller and Registered Veterinary Technician and CVPM Angel Martin. Hello. Each week we bring you current events and news in the veterinary industry and share our thoughts and perspective on how they impact us in our animal hospital. We also try to give you an insight and a behind-the-scenes glance at our clinic and the people in it. This episode 112 is being brought to you once again by Georgia Veterinary Associates, a family of animal hospitals caring for your family pet, where healthy pet means happy life. Is that what it means? I don't know. I'm still trying to work on that. So um, I misspoke a little bit. I said each week we bring you current events and news. We try. We're probably good 50 out of 52 weeks, but we missed last week. We did miss last week, and we weeked, uh, we missed a week in May as well. Yeah. So uh, sometimes uh, personal and business lives just get super busy, and we cannot get it done or make it happen, but we really, really try. Um, for instance, this week, uh, this episode should be posted out on Monday, but we're recording it a little bit early on Thursday night after work. Because we want to make sure we make it happen, and I am going to be out of town this weekend. So, um, post panic pandemic, we opened our lobby on June 1st. We did. And we chose to make it as normal as we used to be. We are not checking uh, vaccine cards. We're not asking clients to sanitize their hands. We're not taking their temperatures. We're not requiring masks. We're trying to be as normal as we can. And yet, if clients are not comfortable uh, not wearing a mask, they can mask up. If they want to continue curbside care, they can. Um, Same goes for sanitizing, right? We have stations out front. We have a giant bottle uh, at the the front desk. So if for whatever reason they do have to touch our credit card terminal, they can certainly sanitize right after. Uh, And so it's gone very well. I think so. I, it, it's pretty much the clients are 50, 50, whether they're wearing a mask or not. And those that aren't, they like are 155% normal. Yeah. Um, those that are, I think are doing it mostly probably out of a courtesy for coming into the building. I would be interested to see like some of them on repeat entrances, you know, like yeah. I've not seen someone come in today and then come back three days later. Are they still wearing a mask? Right. I would bet they're not. Are they, what, why are they doing that or not doing that? Is it out of habit? It is, is it out of family at home? Right. Uh, you know, respect for the business. I, I'm, yeah. It's yeah. all over the Their place. Their current so. vaccine status themselves. Dr. Connor shared with me today, um, that she, she wears a mask every day. She's fully vaccinated, has not had the disease as far as we know. Right. But she wears it so that hopefully she does not become an asymptomatic carrier and transmit it to her family back home. So my understanding is those that when you're vaccinated, they're, you're, even the possibility of that is much, much less. Not, it, it's super low. But yeah. she has three young kids, less than five at home. And so she went into an exam room with a client not wearing a mask. The client was not wearing a mask. She was wearing a mask. And she walked in the door, and I'm waving my finger from left to right. The client's like, oh, no, no, no. This is not going to work. You wearing a mask. The client told her she couldn't wear a mask? Yes. And she said, Dr. Miller, with all due respect, I went off on this client like, this is not your decision on what I do. I'm wearing a mask because I do not want to bring anything home to my family. And she, I mean, she just like lambasted the client. And she said, uh, the client was very respectful thereafter. Hmm. And so we're all punchy, right? Absolutely. Uh, but, uh, it's interesting, you know, that that's human nature and, you wear the mask for yourself more than others, but yet this client got upset that one of our doctors in the exam room is wearing a mask. Why? I don't understand that. Yeah, I don't know. That's that's different as well. I mean, it'd be like going to the restaurant and being upset that your waiter was wearing a mask. Yeah. And maybe, you know, you feel super opinionated on, on reading facial expressions and stuff. I don't I don't know. I don't know why it would really matter. I'm sure matter. there's something underlying for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, and I... I 
coached Dr. Connor. I said, well, you didn't do the wrong thing, but, you know, so we need to be... So to be fair, be... I wonder who the technician was, because our technicians are pretty 50-50 as well. Even if they're vaccinated, I think majority of them go into exam rooms with a mask on. Most... We are Mostly slowly out of every courtesy. day. There's another staff member that's not wearing a mask, and we're right. just kind of letting it evolve and happen. Right. Um. So yeah, I, I that was just interesting. Yeah, for sure. Um, I have not worn a mask in the practice for the last three, maybe four weeks. Whenever uh, before the whole thing came out about mask in public places and whatnot i think i know it was about the same time that the cdc came out with that but um it was before we had announced to our clients and our staff that we were going to do that here in the practice right so anyway we're getting back to normal right my thoughts are and have been as long as we get like 15 days past memorial day which we're approaching that right and there's no huge outbreak that uh, government or social media or other news sources are going to pick up on and start just lambasting us with that information, we're going to be fine. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely not going to go away, right? But I do think, as we've talked about many, many times before, that a lot of the fear came from that instant information that was kind of at hand. Yep, and biased, I would say. Sure, uh, over-dramatizing things, yeah, of yeah, course. Yeah, dramatized for sure. All right, so let's get into this. I'm picking some kind of fuzz off my microphone here. That's what that sound is. Um, news stories? Sure, let's do it. Thought processes, something interesting that happened in the clinic. Um, let me lead off. Clinic-wise, we have started using a new drug called Clevor. C L E V O R. Is that really how it's called? Clevor? Or, or it might is be it clever. clever? It could be or... clever. If you're from West Texas, this is probably called Clevor. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, uh, you might pronounce it clever. Um, a new drop that you put in the eye of a dog or cat, I'm not sure it's approved for anything else, to induce vomiting. Mm -hmm. Why do we induce vomiting in pets? Um, most likely because they've eaten a toxic oh they've eaten something they shouldn't have likely a toxin right so um since we're talking about vomiting and things there are reasons that you shouldn't induce vomiting what are those so sometimes oh gosh wait pause what is the medical word oh, for we've talked vomiting? about this before because i say it weird I say emesis, and so, you call it emesis. Emesis, yes. E-M-E-S-I-S, -E -S -S, emesis. And that's not the West Texas version. No. But it's like respiratory or respiratory. Tomato, tomato. Yeah, true. So, anyways, yes, there are definitely some reasons that you shouldn't induce vomiting as well. So, right. if a pet has eaten something that you know is jagged or could cause trauma coming back up the esophagus. Right. Um, some caustic agents, they say that you shouldn't uh, allow them to... A chemical that would like right. burn the esophagus so coming like up. Clorox. Bleaches, yeah. that kind of thing. Um, so the... Interesting. You pause. Should pump pause. The... Stop. Okay. We so, don't do it that often. We were going to... We could go there. So Clorox yes. is like Coke. Yes. You just said bleach, and I said, oh, yeah, Clorox. Because to me, every bleach product, which is hydrogen... I don't know, chloride? <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not. It's chlorine I, I, I don't and something else. I don't doesn't... even know. It's not H2O2. That's peroxide. But uh, a bleach product, she's going to look it up I as am, we're talking. Because I have to now. Bleach is a obviously a specific... Uh, organic compound, but yet most of us in the United of States, United of States, I said, <laughs> uh, just say bleach or say Clorox, uh, and and we know that's bleach. How funny when you Google bleach, you get like this um... Clorox thing. No, it's this. Oh gosh, what well, I don't even know what it's called. Anime. Uh, Apparently, there's like an anime. Uh... Pokemon kind of a thing. So it looks yeah. like to me. Interesting. Um, so anyway, it's like if, if you're going to drink a soda, a brown soda, you're going to say Coke. 
and growing up, a Coke could be a Pepsi, could be a Coca-Cola. Absolutely. Could be a, an RC Cola, could be a, a Kroger Cola. Right. But a Coke was a Coke, and we know what that meant. You're going to be really surprised about the, the formula for bleach. Okay, what is it? N-A-C-L-O. Sodium. N-A-C-L, like another capital O. Yep. Sodium chloride oxide. Sodium chlorine oxygen. Okay. Huh. Yeah, I am surprised. Yeah, very weird. Um, so anyways, we I was talking about in the sense that, you know, you hear about people who like overdose on drugs and stuff and they quote unquote pump their stomachs. Um, you can not necessarily quote unquote pump a stomach, but can't you like wash out like you could pass a stomach tube you can and you do could a essentially lavage. lavage them. Yep. Yeah. So, so would you do that for bleach? You would consider it, but quite frankly, a pet is not going to drink enough bleach. So let's taste. say they did. You would uh, lavage their you stomach. You would lavage yeah. their stomach, do a gastric lavage, which is a big uh, thing to do, and or you would give um, activated charcoal. Okay. Toxaban. Okay. So I have... I have Which, been veterinary practices for 14 years this year, and, and I've never, one. ever seen a gastric I've lavage. I've twice. Yeah. Um, so a lot of people, I think, are pretty confused about that when they bring their pets in. You know, like we typically try to make them vomit, especially if they eat something. And then if they don't, we usually treat symptomatically. And a lot of people are very confused, like, why can't you pump the stomach? Yeah. Um, so I have a thought, because a lot of people that OD on these illicit drugs, they're passed out. Oh, yeah. They can't. They're not going to vomit. You cannot induce vomiting. Yeah. Same thing, like when you give a medication that can induce vomiting, your thing might, I somewhat will take pride in thinking that I taught you this, but um, an anesthetized pet cannot vomit. Yeah. And yet, one of the staff members uh, in the past week said, oh, yeah, but if if you're drunk at home and you're asleep, you can vomit. I'm like, yeah, I will give you that. But that's not under general anesthesia. Yeah, it's a little different. But they're absolutely right. And that's typically how like human ODs and like I will drunk not people name that staff member, die, by the way. Right? Because they usually do choke on their own vomit. Yeah. Um, but so, interesting. It's just cool. And, and we're bringing this up because Clever, not Cleaver, Clever <laughs> is a new product and it's a better way to do things. It's better than us putting apomorphine tablets in the conjunctival sac or the eye of a pet, right. inducing vomiting, irritating their eye, rinsing it out to get it out of their system, so to speak, uh, to stop the vom- vomiting. And it's and way better it's than peroxide. A, oh, yeah. Which th- yeah. I think that's kind of more of an at-home remedy. We don't usually use that Probably in the practice. Probably 50% chance of working. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's a cool new drug, and... We're happy to have that in the practice. So we've uh, used it, we've had it maybe for a week and we've used it four times, which is so crazy because so that's where we I was gonna typically go. order like six tablets of apomorphine at a time and yeah. they last until, you know, an typically entire year. Typically 10 cases a year yeah. of inducing vomiting and four or five within the last seven days. Yeah. Crazy. So, um, I printed out your story about cytozoonosis. Yes. Bobcat fever. Mm-hmm. That became a problem in the southeast uh, probably seven to eight years ago that we started recognizing that. And so the disease is Cytosine felis, I believe. Actually, it could be Cytosine canis, I'm not sure. But it is carried by bobcats, which we do have in our region. And ticks will take a blood meal from the bobcat and become infected themselves with the protozoal protozoal organism. Mm -hmm. And then they will uh, bite and or attach, well, attach and bite your cat. And then your cat will become extremely ill. So there's, did you say there's only one type of tick that will really transmit this? I did not say, but it's the Lone Star Tick. And so, very if clients much, are at home and they need to identify a lone star tick, what are one of the biggest identifying factors? Uh, a white spot on the middle of its dorsal back. 
dorsal back. Yeah. Lone Star. What's the Lone Star State? Texas. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, that's where that kind of yeah. comes from, like the Lone Star State, Lone Star Tick. Yeah. It has one lone white, not a star, dot on its dorsal back. So importance being, or I guess some of the things that we worry about this, right, is it's mostly fatal if domestic cats uh, are infected with this disease. Yes, we have seen cats in the clinic here uh, early on have not diagnosed it and have they have succumbed. To the disease uh, you basically treat them supportively you yeah. cannot kill the organism you just have to treat them symptomatically and support their systems um, unlike some of the other t- tick transmitted diseases ehrlichia rocky mountain spotted fever to be of note lyme disease as well you do kind of treat the symptoms but those diseases typically cause <coughs> more of a uh, decrease in the red blood cell count and or platelet count so this is a little bit different they develop a fever it's very similar to FIP and my thoughts on coronavirus it's the body's reaction to the organism in the body they start developing this huge inflammatory reaction and the body just kind of goes crazy so interesting that you say that this article basically states that the bobcats even though like you can talk about them being from like the same genus or whatnot. Um, they are totally unaffected, even though our domestic cats get very ill with the yeah. same disease. Interesting. Yeah, they will carry it, mm-hmm. right? So let's put that in corona terms, right? So right. you can acquire coronavirus infection, COVID-19, if you will, and probably a third, if not 40% of the population gets it is completely asymptomatic probably 30 to 40 percent of the population gets it has some mild or maybe major symptoms Mm -hmm. and then definitely less than 10 to 5 percent get the disease and actually are hospitalized and have problems so um, tis the nature of the infectious beast i think yeah so the best thing people can do is just keep their cat inside and away from ticks Yeah, yeah And if your cats are outside, we would recommend Revolution Plus, a monthly product you put on the on on them. I was going to say on your cat uh, that is uh, absorbed through the skin, takes care of and prevents intestinal parasites and ectoparasites, including fleas and ticks. So interesting, though, as you were saying that, I was kind of looking it up because I feel like I remember that Revolution Plus does not actually treat the Lone Star Tick. Oh, does Brevecto? I was going to look that up as well. Merck's Brevecto product. Yeah, so let me see here. But when we say does not prevent a specific tick, these drug companies have to go through testing exactly. protocols and procedures. Right, and so and prove that we so. would have to reach out to Jason to kind of find yeah. exactly Jason our Zoetis. And Jason's gonna say, "Oh yeah, we 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 cover that. We we guarantee that." Mm-hmm. So, all right. While you're looking that up, um, we will get to your locomotion discussion. Yeah. In a so. As you suggest, right, we typically try to relate things to what's happening in the practice currently, and the whole locomotion thing um, has come up with one of our uh, our feline patients in the practice. Okay. Do and tell. so uh, we saw a cat come in from a rescue, and we... Um... Sorry, real quick. The Brevecto does not list the Lone Star Tick either. Huh. In canines, most of these monthly products do list the Lone Star Tick, though. Yes. It's being covered. Correct. Okay. Uh, so anyways, back to the whole locomotion in cats. So, well, in really anything. We saw a cat today, or not today, I guess late last week, in regards to the fact that it came in because it just wasn't acting right at the rescue. And um, the cat was just standing abnormally on the table during the physical exam. And so we took it into a room and allowed it to walk around. And it was mentioned by the doctor that the cat is walking very plantigrade. Okay. Um, And so plantigrade, I am not going to break the word apart 
that's totally up to you. Um, but there are some different other types of walking that we see in the practice as well. Um, I don't even know how to pronounce it. Digitigrade, where they're walking more on their toes. And you that was a new term for me. Typically. When you sent this for me to look at. So, yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. I mean, but you've seen this, right? Like, you've seen the dogs that literally will come in and they're, like, just screeching across on their toenails. When they're super anxious, scared, afraid, yeah. they dig their digits into the ground, mm-hmm. the quote-unquote ground, which is the hard surface. Exam table, yeah. And they can't walk. So, but digitigrade is technically, from what I understand, is more termed to, like, hoofed animals because they're hoofed. going to walk on their hooves instead of their actual foot if right. you will so the interesting thing to me is i've never thought about this in that way uh ungulates or hoofed animals walk on the tips of their digits right so ungulates hoofed animals that we have seen or you know of horses horses pigs sheep cows goats probably others maybe uh I was going to say ocelots, but uh, ostriches is what I was, I'm like, oh, that's <laughs> I, not I, right. don't, I don't think so. Uh, emus and ostriches, I, I no, they're I different. I so. They're no. more like birds. Yeah, yeah they, they have, more have the uh, I would call velociraptor. Them more plantigrade. So that meaning that they're going to be walking yeah. on their metatarsal bones. So digigrade means walking on the surface of your nail mm-hmm. is the way to put that, I think. And so how many quote-unquote nails does a horse have that they're walking on one what they only have one nail on all four feet they have one one hoof on all four feet yes a cow i said four though they have four legs oh gosh no (laughs) on each one uh cow goat sheep the same how many do they have they have two very good guess two weight bearing Kind of like a dog bearing weight on uh, digits three and four. So they only they have two weight bearing and then two non weight bearing. Yep. That's so interesting. Do you know how I know this? Because you certainty? lived on a farm. Well, I did, but in vet school, I got this is kind of gross, but from the necropsy lab, I got the distal limb of a horse, cow, sheep, and pig, and I. This is going to be super weird, but you take these distal limbs and you can take the soft tissue off of them. Mm -hmm. You can either do it yourself or you can put them in a fire ant bed, which works very well. Wow, that's interesting. And then you, once the soft tissue is gone, you soak these bones in peroxide and it, I guess it whitens them up and... It makes them last moving forward, and then you can put them all back together, the bones back together with glue or epoxy, in my case. And so... So, this is getting very weird. I don't have them anymore. This was more <laughs> for study, but the uh, point of the story... What's that on the shelf over the there? The <laughs> point of the story is a cow and a sheep and a goat and a pig stand on the... Third and fourth Mm -hmm. phalanges and metacarpals or metatarsals, but they also have the fifth and the second as the little, what we would call dew claws in a small animal. They Mm -hmm. have four. That's so interesting because I... But dogs and cats have, 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 they stand on, you know, two and three as far as most of the weight and then, uh... They, I guess, I'm sorry, three and four, most of the weight, two and five, five are kind of dangling, and then their dew claw is, is the first digit. But in dogs and cats, two and five, you'll see pressure or imprints on. So, like, let's look at, let's think about a them, footprint. Yeah. Let's yeah. look at a footprint, right? So, if a, if a dog or a cat walks through paint or ink, you're going to see four toes. Correct. Uh, You're not going to see the dew claw, which is not present in these large animal Right, ungulates. but you said two and five are dangling. I mean, they, they're there. They're just not carrying majority of the weight they like three and weight. four are. But what I'm saying on a horse and a cow and a sheep and a goat, 
Yeah, they they're going to be there small as well, like and little dangly. bitty nubbings. Yeah, crazy. But uh, it's very cool. And then the horse, um, t- uh, three and four are fused together to create just one. So nonetheless, this is basically plantigrade, digitigrade, ungulates. It's how they are walking on their. How do humans walk? Plantigrade. Yep. So you talked about the cat. Was it a diabetic cat in the end? No, I think the cat has some neuro issues. Okay. Um, like it has uh, and or musculoskeletal disease. Um, so yeah, it just its back legs are very different. I don't think it really realizes that it always has them. I know the doctors have done CP deficits, and so they're not super reactive. Basically, like the cat doesn't know that its foot is flipped upside down, and so it doesn't correct it. Um, but again, when the cat does walk, he walks very flat footed, right. um, not so, just the paw pad, but the entire foot is on the ground. So yes, this particular cat and other cats we've seen, they are walking with their ankle down on the ground, mm-hmm. which is exactly the way a human walks. Right. But pets are typically up digigrade, mm-hmm. digit grade. Did you grade? Yeah. It's just a very weird new it's, term for me. It is a weird uh, term. But we we talk about that. Uh, pets, their ankles are up high in the sky, and their digits are on the ground, typically. Right. But, yes, the uh, plantar grain stance indicates a neuropathy, typically. Neuro- neurologically, the cat or dog... Uh, they're so weak that their entire ankle contacts the ground. And in cats, the most common cause of that is diabetes mellitus. So that's why I ask. Mm. As far as I understand, diabetes is not on this cat's rollout list. Um, however, they are being, it's being tested for toxoplasma. Okay. So a neurologic condition Mm -hmm. that could be causing that. So, yeah. Um, and typically with rescue cats, right, from this specific rescue, it's not unlikely for it to have something, I guess, odd or not super common. Uh, correct. With fur kids' cases, it's like they went to Chernobyl three times. Yeah. I mean, because who knows where some of the pets come from, you yeah. know? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I did pull an article about wildlife. Mm -hmm. and what you should do when you find baby, very young wildlife critters. And so I thought this was pretty appropriate. Uh, Typically, every year in in the spring in Georgia, people, residents, homeowners, start cutting down pine trees. Mm -hmm. And when they do that, they fall the tree or fell the tree and... All of a sudden, a squirrel's nest is found and baby squirrels are found. Yeah. Super, super common. But we also see baby squirrels, baby birds, baby rabbits. Right. Baby, I've not ever seen a baby ground squirrel. Um, but you don't even know what a ground squirrel is, do you? Was, no, That's a Texas thing. I feel like thing. we've also talked about this too. Are they not like moles or groundhogs? No, they're chipmunk, chipmunks. We call them ground squirrels in Texas. Oh, well, yeah. Um, I've never seen a baby one because they're all very small. A baby one's probably got to be like the size of a dime. So the common thought process is with birds, if you, or let's say with any wildlife, if you see something very young that's on the ground... And the mom is not there, and it's flailing, fledgling, struggling, whatever. The first thought most people have is, oh, my gosh, I can't touch this thing because if I do, my scent's going to get on it, and the mom will never take it back. Mm -hmm. The second thought is, oh, my gosh, this critter is on the ground, and it's struggling. I have to rescue it. Mm -hmm. And then once you kind of work through those two processes – and you wind up picking up this critter, you're like, oh, crap, what do I do with it? Right. And so you want to save it. So typically, you take it into your household for 6, 12, 18 hours, honestly, never more than 24 because you're, you're freaking out by then. <laughs> and you're you're either trying to take care of it and feed it because food is love. you got to feed it immediately. 
right? Right. So let's go get some cat food, some some AD. Let's start feeding this thing. And it just goes from bad to worse. Um, so this article out of where? Tufts. Tufts. I thought was very well done, very succinct. Very uh, in line with my thinking process. Mm -hmm. You know, they say that, number one, whenever you see or find an animal on the ground, don't panic. Don't worry that you have to save it because maybe it's there for a reason. Maybe this is part of the process of it developing. Right. Uh, Number two, they, they say do not believe the myth that if you touch uh, an exotic or not exotic, more of a wildlife animal, the mom is not going to reject it forever. And so that is a myth, which I found kind of interesting. Yeah. I mean, people even I kinda, say that. I, I kind of bought into that thought process. To be honest with you, I talked to a client not too long ago um, who felt the same way about her breeding dog that had puppies recently one of the puppies was not doing well and she was very nervous about going in and touching it and i mean it's it's weird to me because like we we birth yeah, puppies yeah, you know yeah. and the mothers take to them we're the first scent that those puppies have and the mothers still treat them you know so i thought it was very weird when she mentioned that but i do know that that's kind of an old wives tale that people say and it can be somewhat true i would kind of buy into that right i I said earlier i thought that probably was true but um the big couple big take-home points is a bird that falls out of the nest that has no feathers is different than a bird that's on the ground that has some young feathers called a feathering. The bird's called a feathering at that right. point. Those birds are forced out of the nest onto the ground. Mom is watching. Mom is helping to take care of, but it's a process of them growing up. And so they will oftentimes be, oftentimes be seen flooding around the ground. They can't really take flight, right. but they're trying. And mom will feed and take care of and protect those birds. The baby bird that fell out of the nest, and I'd never thought of this, uh, with no feathers, the best thing you can do is build as close to a nest as you think it came out of and either leave it on the ground in the area for mom to come find that bird or take it up on the tree where you think the nest is or you know the nest is and attach it to the tree. Hmm. And so... I'd never thought of that. I would venture to say most people have never thought of that. The instinct is, oh my gosh, I found this baby squirrel bird rabbit. I've got to take care of it. 99.8 times out of 100 when you do that, that animal is not going to live. Sure. Is is my thoughts. Okay, I could be wrong, could be wrong statistically, but well, once you do that, you take you take that young animal out of their natural environment, and you, even if you think you know how to take care of them, you don't, um, and the best thing you, you can do at that point is contact a wildlife rehab specialist. So that's a very good point, right? So I do feel like when, every once in a while, and probably it happens more than we know, Clients will call the front desk here at our animal hospital and they will say to the receptionist, like, I found this bird. Can I bring it to you? Or I found this squirrel. Can I bring it to you? Baby Um, rabbit. And typically there's nothing we can do for them. And quite frankly, we don't have a wildlife rehab license. And so we shouldn't be having those pets. Good point. You do have to have a license. We can humanely euthanize them if they need to be euthanized. Um, Like if they, you know, I have heard like baby rabbits, you know, people would be going over the lawn and suddenly they've hit a nest of baby rabbits and, you know, a couple of them are injured or whatnot. Did you? Real, I I read the article and I guess I knew this but didn't. Female rabbits with babies, they make a nest in the shallow ground. They kind of burrow out, not deep, but they they kind of make a nest. I guess that's the best way to put it in the ground. I'll say it again, and then they pluck their own hair to line the nest, the way a bird would make a nest up in the tree. Hmm. That's interesting. No, I didn't know that they pluck their own hair, but and I have definitely seen a rabbit's nest. And that's where the baby nest. rabbits 
stay. And so hmm. it's like if you come across all this rabbit hair, don't think a hawk came down and killed the rabbit. It's it was probably a nest. Yeah. So interesting. Yeah, I thought that was cool. Um, but so back to the whole, like you need a wildlife license, a rehab license in order to do this. And so we do not have that, even though we do have veterinarians in the hospital. And so oftentimes we give them a resource, uh, which this article has a resource for Tufts wildlife clinic. And I thought it was interesting that they basically said that call them anytime for advice. Huh. That's cool. Um, yeah. So if you find any type of baby animal, pick up the phone and call Tufts wildlife clinic. 508-839-7918. In Georgia, you would call the Georgia, is it DNR? Department of Natural Resources. Resources. Yep. Um, You can probably still call these people. Yeah. And they'll be able to give you, you. yeah, Yeah. Uh, in your state or city, the the direct people to to talk to. I'm not sure why that caught my eye, but I chose to read it and I'm like, huh, learn something new every day. Quite frankly, I mean, it's very relevant, right? So there is a bird's nest, um on my back patio. So I have like a deck and then I, it's, there's a patio. And so on the light fixture, um, there's a bird's nest. I don't even know what kind of birds they are, but you can see there's two birds that kind of hang out. There's bird poop all over my patio. Um, and they come and like in the morning, you can hear them in the morning. And so Lance and I got a ladder and we went up there and we took pictures. And so we have pictures of just the eggs. And then most oh, recently, gosh, I weird. kind of like took a camera up there and uh, on my you phone. You have like a real time camera, like no. a webcam? No, 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 no. Like I only thought about it because I thought the nest was abandoned, right? Because you can't see anything. And so there's like just junk all over the, the light fixture. So I was going to ask Lance to hose it down. And then he looked up there and it was, there were like five or six eggs in there. Um, and then most recently I looked up there and there was one little, I guess like hatched bird. And then there were like four eggs. Um, so totally weird. It had like, just like baby feathers. It was like face down in the nest. I don't know if it was dead or what, but obviously I wasn't going to go like playing around with it, it but I just wanted to see, you know, what was up there. Because obviously we don't see the adult birds. Like we see them fly out of the patio and like underneath the deck, but we don't ever see them in the nest. Yeah. Um, so funny story on me. Uh, Sunday I was running at Mulberry Park, Little mm-hmm. Mulberry Park. Yeah. And I'm at about the point five, point six, where that little, the, the creek to the left next to the road is. You've mm-hmm. seen that and the creek to the right going down. And all of a sudden, this, in my opinion, big red thing just comes right in front of me and then lands over to the right. It was a brilliantly red cardinal. Mm -hmm. And it scared the bejeebies out of me. It was just so, it was so big and flew right in front of me, but it was like in its own habitat. So Mm -hmm. I'm like, I jumped like I jumped when I saw, I saw the the black snake. I told you about that, right? That almost stepped on the other day. It's like, yeah, my gosh, (laughs) nature, nature is beautiful, but nature can be scary. So, of course, um, the only other story I had that I was going to mention, I'll let you sign us out is, uh, Nevada has passed a bill to allow veterinarians to talk about and prescribe CBD products. And I believe it goes into effect in October. October I actually 1. read that too, and I, I didn't think it was Nevada, but I, I I had read that as well. And so historically, they were you could the, like the client could tell you, and we have CBD stores all over here, mm-hmm. right? And like in the Atlanta area, even though like recreational marijuana or medical marijuana is not necessarily legal, um, but we do have these like the CBD stores, yep. like my CBD store and whatever locally but as a veterinarian you're not allowed to discuss it as a therapy option talk about or recommend it right yeah or prescribe it right yeah. and so there are some products out there and which they're I, like, you can to be honest i don't understand that at all like why can't you discuss it yeah i don't know i mean i guess because it's, it's an not, illegal substance yeah, here. But it's not thc it's cbd i don't know so. But yes, I thought it was interesting that yes, they can now talk about it under the new law and they can actually prescribe it. And um, if anybody would do it, it would be Nevada. Yeah, to of course. Lead the pack, so. Of course. Anything else on your end? I don't think so. Mm. Um, we are definitely like it feels like full fledged in the summer. It's hot. It's humid. It's hot, gross outside. Humid. Yep. Um, summer's still what twelve days away though. The summer solstice. Twenty. 
12 yeah 12 days okay. away the 22nd usually um i feel like it's only going to get hotter here in georgia like i couldn't wait at memorial day i was like can it just please get hot and yeah. now i it's like so miserable and hot and humid the one thing i've noticed the last week to 10 days is i and slash we uh, we being you included and other vets and really the industry, we have been waiting for the world to open up and now it's open and I'm looking at my calendar and I've got so many meetings and events and things coming up. Yeah. Because everything has been put off. It's and exciting, that's but it's also stressful. Mm-hmm. Like, Oh my gosh, I got to go here for four days and I'm back for two weeks and I go here for five days and then we do the family vacation. I've got this meeting. I got that meeting. I got BMG. So a yeah. little stress, but we will get through it. Sure, yeah. With the help of Dr. Yi and Dr. Seek, yep. Dr. Evans, Dr. Reese, Dr. Connor, Dr. Williams, Dr. Hines. Who did I forget? That's them. That's all of them. Yep. That's all of them that help us here at Russell. Yep. So. Okay. All right, guys. Check in next week as we discuss more in the news and in our industry. Follow us on Instagram at People Pets and Vets. Make sure to follow all of our clinics on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Check out our blogs on our website at mygavet.com. Please hit subscribe or download wherever you're listening to this podcast. And remember, without people, pets are simply animals. Bye, guys. <laughs>